Hi, everybody, and welcome to our se uh, second day of the ASA Safety Week. Um, if you haven't been here already, my name's John Franklin. Uh, I'm head of safety promotion here at EASA, and I'm kind of leading us through this week of uh, different events that we're having. Uh, before we start this uh, aerodrome session, uh, I'm just going to run through a few quick logistics so that you know how things are going to work and how you can really interact and get involved in the discussions today. So we have uh, an app called Slido that's built into the WebEx here. So you should find it in the bottom right hand corner of your screen. Uh, there's apps and Slido and there's a Q&A section and you can ask questions. Uh, and then the other thing you can do is uh, upvote other people's questions. So it's quite often worth seeing rather than you know, just adding more and more questions on the same topic is if you see somebody who's already asked a similar question is to upvote those so that they come to the top of the list. And we'll get through as many questions as we can later on in the session. And the other ones that we don't, we'll, we'll save them, take them away and you know, try and provide as many answers as we can in our future safety promotion activities and things like that. <clears throat> If you have any technical problems, so the only technical problem we have sometimes with this is sometimes people don't get sound. So if you do have a problem with the sound and you're not using Chrome, perhaps jump out of the session, come back in in a Chrome browser if you can. Um, but mostly it works. If you have anything you need to talk to me about as the host, if you can use the chat function, which again is in the bottom right hand corner. Uh, and then hopefully it should all run really well. We had a great three sessions yesterday, uh, three more today, uh, and let's just get on with the show. So I'll hand over to my colleague, Edward. Thank you very much, John, and, and good morning, everyone. I see a very good turnout so far in terms of participants. Uh, my name is Edward Chofo. I'm here in IASA as the head of air operations and aerodromes, and I have the pleasure of moderating uh, today's first panel. We started off yesterday with some more horizontal topics, and now we are doing a, a deep dive in the technical domains. And, and the first one to, to, to start the proceedings today is, of course, aerodromes. Aerodromes are indeed very important in the ecosystem of, um, of actors in, in the aviation uh, domain, where uh, a lot of uh, processes come together, and they have to come together in a, in a meaningful and articulated way. And we'll discuss about the challenges and, and the priorities that come with that. Uh, I'm here uh, not alone by, by any means. Actually, I'm in very good company with uh, three incredible panelists, uh, three safety practitioners, uh, people that do safety management uh, on a daily basis. Uh, and, and those are Jasper Dams joining us from Netherlands, from Schiphol Airport, where he is the Senior Management for Compliance and Continuity Risk. Uh, we move over to the UK and we have Yogesh Farek from John Menzies PLC, where uh, uh, Yogesh is Senior Vice President for Operational Risks. And moving further west in Ireland uh, with uh, Declan Collins uh, from the Dublin Airport, Head of Operational Safety. Again, three distinguished professionals, three believers in safety that will walk us through the, the topics of today. And, uh, and the, the leitmotiv of today's uh, webinar is integrated safety management. And underneath this uh, leitmotiv, we have three sub-themes that we will uh, cover more in, uh, in depth as we go along. And those can be summarized as follows. Is what are the challenges of a setting up a functioning aerodrome SMS and an integrated one. Uh, how are we fostering a proper safety culture, a non-punitive safety culture, which is a key enabler of an integrated aerodrome SMS? And of course, looking at the future, what are the challenges ahead of us now that we see uh, the signs of, of recovery after the two years of COVID pandemics. Without further ado, I would like to invite Jasper to, to, to give us his perspective on these three themes. We will have the same coming from you <laughs> and Declan, and then we'll open the panel for a more, more in-depth discussion. And of course, we're counting on you to, to keep it interesting by asking all those good questions. Jasper, over to you. 
Yeah, Edward, uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to uh, to present our uh, initiative here in the Netherlands uh, to this uh, EASA audience. Uh, my name is Jasper Dams. I've been working for about four years now at Schiphol and before that uh, about 18 years at ATC. So I uh, made the switch from the air traffic control to the aerodrome uh, and started working there on what we call the integral safety management system. Now I will try to share my presentation. Share. There it is. Screen right. Okay, this needs some time to build up, but uh, hopefully it's there now. So uh, I will uh, dive into the three topics uh, that you mentioned. Um, our, um, our initiative to have an integral safety management system, uh, we started working on that in uh, 2018. Uh, and we had two reasons for doing that. One was that we uh, wanted to take the next step and uh, parties at Schiphol, including the, the, the home carrier, ATC and, and the aerodrome operator were very enthusiastic about their internal developments on safety management and wanted to, uh, to jointly pursue that further. And the other one was that we uh, had a rather critical um, report about, of our uh, NTSB. Oh, yes, but uh, yeah? sorry, just to let you know that the sharing isn't working. So maybe okay. sharing your screen again, just uh, it I came up. Again. Yeah, I was still at the title page. So. <laughs> But I will okay. try again, and please let me know if it works, share. There, now we've got it. You got it? Okay. Yeah. And if I put it in full screen, is it still visible? Oh, no, it's when you go to full screen. Okay. That is, so. so now it's back again? Uh, no, okay. you might. I will, I will do it again and then uh, do not the full screen. Yeah, that's probably the best thing. Okay, share. Is it here? Yeah, let me see it. Thanks. Okay. Uh, so that was the, the reason we started this initiative. Um, and I will, uh, so we have now four years of experience in doing it. And I will share with you uh, the challenges that we faced and, and how we uh, overcame uh, those. Um, so I. Um, I organized that in the do's and the don'ts. Um, and uh, to start with the do's is that you, if you want to set up uh, such a system, uh, in my view, you need to involve the nominated persons. So the people actually responsible for the op operational safety in their own organization, uh, because at, at those nominated persons, also the, the trade-off between budgets and acceptance of risks uh, uh, comes together. Uh, and then you can have the, 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 the truly productive conversation about joint risk uh, acceptance. The other one is that you need to have uh, a driving force to, uh, to do the work. And that is uh, the Joint Safety Office. So I am the head of the Joint Safety Office uh, at Schiphol. Uh, and that's it, for us a, a tiny, tiny, small uh, four, four persons uh, uh, program management office. And we work together with a lot of experts uh, from the different uh, safety departments of the organizations at Schiphol, so that we are not a column uh, or a silo uh, on our own, but we are truly integrating all those expertise and, uh, and work. Then the third one is that you should focus on risk assessment. Yeah? So, uh, and that is something that is, uh, was, was quite uh, a, a positive uh, uh, development uh, and an eye-opener that, that uh, those organizations, that they all truly want to, to be safe and to reduce their risks. So on, on other issues, there can be competition or even uh, disagreements. Uh, but on, if we talk about the safety, uh, we can always uh, come, to, uh, come to the next step. Then the, the fourth one, it's, uh, well, Obvious uh, to say, but, uh, but, but, but truly important to have the pilots, the ATC, also the ground handlers at all levels at the table. So at the, often you see that the nominated persons are, um, are also uh, part-time uh, uh, operational people, uh, but also uh, for the analysis. And what we did is that we, 
uh, adhere to the ICAO principles of safety management as they are designed for, uh, for all. Then for the don'ts, uh, you cannot step into the, the safety responsibilities of the individual organizations. Uh, so they, they have a, a legal obligation to do, do things. So what we, what we say is we, we don't take it over. We, we, we cannot do that. We are not allowed to do that. But we, we are doing these things together. So if a decision is taken in the uh, integral safety management system, that is as well the uh, decision of those individual uh, nominated persons. So it has also uh, the power of execution in their own organization. Uh, the next one is that we avoid it uh, to have other um, entities uh, than uh, uh, operational organizations with the safety responsibility at the, responsibility at the table uh, so that we don't get kind of political discussions um, uh, mixing up with our safety management uh, discussion. Uh, we didn't allow replacements so we need to have the, the nominated persons uh, at the table uh, and, and they are not allowed to send uh, the deputies. Uh, and the last one is that you, you easily fall into a trap of bureaucracy uh, but you need to focus on, on the ball as we say in, in Dutch. And so you have to, to, to focus on the true risks uh, and act on it uh, instead of uh, making all kinds of paperwork. Well, these are our do's and don'ts, and this led to, uh, to a number of uh, outcomes. Uh, first of all, we, um, we made the top five interface risks, both for the, the, the flight operations and for the ground operations. So these are the two main uh, uh, subjects in our scope. And then you see that, uh, well, you, you can read it for yourself, uh, but the, the usual suspects like runway incursion are there. But for example, also uh, loss of control during takeoff, uh, where, where also the, the runway allocation and the, 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 the weather, uh, how, how you uh, deal with uh, strong winds uh, is, is an interface uh, risk. In a more ground handling part, uh, it are things like uh, damage on aircraft stands, collisions on service roads, uh, etc. And we have in the ISMS a joint dashboard and bow ties of each of these risks. So we can monitor them, we can see which threats in the bow tie uh, are uh, uh, causing an increase uh, or not. And then we can set out actions uh, for the, the organization who is uh, responsible for the, the barriers uh, that, that should prevent that. Well, here are some uh, examples of, uh, of risk mitigations that we, uh, we took. Uh, and really a big one is uh, that Schiphol is uh, completing now a, a new independent taxiway, uh, which crosses over a, a highway. So that's a, a rather a big, big uh, project, uh, but that truly helps to, to reduce the workload of, of ground controllers and therefore also the risk on, uh, on pushback collisions, uh, for example. Uh, and the other one is uh, in the ground handling uh, part, uh, adverse weather procedure. Yeah, so we, we had a, a, a process norm that each ground handler should have its own adverse weather procedure. But the ground handler said, well, we want together, we want to have a, a, a concrete uh, a maximum uh, uh, wind uh, level. And after that, we stop uh, operations. And that is typically a thing that you should do together. And it helps them that if the storm comes, then it's not a situation that one continues to work and the other one uh, stops with all the questions of the airlines asked. Uh, well, many more mitigations uh, were taken and they can be found on our public website, uh, integralsafetyschiphol.com. Uh, this is something we did for ourselves uh, to, to show the public uh, what we are doing, to be transparent about it, also about the, the due dates of those uh, mitigations. Um, and also in response to our uh, NTSB, huh? so they, uh, they, they publish, uh, published a, a rather critical report and then it's good to show as an aviation community what you are doing uh, about it. So you can all find it there and it's updated every half year. Then something about the culture, because this is all uh, the, the structure, but the culture is, 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 is rather important to, to make it truly work. And here, I think we had the, the benefit of uh, what we call the polder model. 
So in, in Holland, we have a tradition of working together, even if we disagree, because if we, we don't do that on the, on the, the water management, uh, well, you, you can uh, uh, get your point uh, against your opponent, but you have wet feet. So we have learned the hard way that we have to work together for an overarching objective. Uh, so, and we, we see that here as well. Uh, so, as I mentioned, sometimes uh, organizations have different interests, uh, different products, uh, but if we talk about safety, uh, they, they all have this uh, number one priority uh, interest to, uh, to achieve that. Then I have uh, <clears throat> two more slides about uh, the culture and uh, the future challenges. Uh, first one about safety culture. Uh, if you work together, you have to be open. Uh, you need to have trust and that, well, trust is built over time and on, on personal relations, but you also need to have the, the legal framework uh, that you create a, what I call a, a safe space to do that. For example, we do joint incident investigations where the, the, the uh, organizations involved with an incident or an accident jointly investigate what happened and make recommendations. And for example, if the, the accident involves a, a damage to an aircraft caused by a ground handler, and you want to have the airline and the aerodrome and the ground handler doing the joint investigation, you need to create the safe space that the information shared is not used for claims, uh, for example. So we established that with a uh, non-disclosure agreement uh, where we say that this information can only be used for, for safety purposes. And this requires the participating organizations to build what we call Chinese walls between their safety department uh, and the legal department. Uh, so we achieved uh, doing that, uh, but I do uh, realize that this is uh, uh, rather uh, exceptional uh, because uh, well, it's 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 the the choice of the accountable managers to uh, to 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 sign this NDA, and I can imagine that uh, some organizations might might find the liability uh, also very important. So it is my opinion that uh, further protection of shared safety information is necessary uh, from the regulator. Uh, to enable that at all aerodromes, uh, so that if you work together on, on safety, you don't have to worry about liability uh, consequences. And then the last one, uh, well, uh, we have a, a rather uh, busy time at Schiphol because we had uh, significant problems in scaling up. Um, main uh, reason was uh, a shortage of security staff but what we see if you dive into it that there's a shortage and and capacity constraints in all parts of the the value chain um, and we are very busy in managing that uh, but i think it also has a potential impact on safety because what we see is that new interdependencies between processes uh, uh, emerge and this is a bit like the, the normal uh, accident theory of, of Perro. Eh? If you have tightly coupled uh, processes, uh, you can get uh, snowball effects. And our ISMS is, uh, is engaged to, uh, to, to look into that uh, and to, to mitigate it. Uh, I can give two examples. Uh, for example, if, if passengers uh, miss their flight because of security uh, queues, uh, then the luggage need to be offloaded of the aircraft and the, the ground handler also has a shortage of staff. So there's a coupling and a potential risk, uh, which was not there before. Uh, another one is that if, uh, if airlines have a shortage of, uh, of uh, flight attendants, uh, for example, or, or pilots, then they might uh, hire uh, external uh, airlines to to, uh, to do the flights for them, uh, but they will fly under the same call sign. So ATC might think that this is a pilot who is well known at the airport, while in fact it is a foreign pilot. Uh, and this is also a new safety coupling, uh, which, uh, which needs uh, attention. So I'm not saying that these are uh, immediate or urgent risks, um, but what I do say is that we need to adapt our, our way of safety management 
to uh, to to take that on board and to uh, to 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 see how big it is and to mitigate where necessary. Well, this brings me to the conclusion of my presentation. Uh, thank you very much again for giving this opportunity, and I'm uh, looking forward to taking your uh, your questions uh, later on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jasper. A very interesting uh, initiative. Uh, thank you for for allowing us to to get more uh, into it and, and and learning from you. I think there will be a lot of questions. I also have uh, a few of myself. Uh, also, a very important point about uh, the propensity for, for risk transfer in highly interconnected systems like aviation. Uh, and uh, again, going integrated perhaps is, is the solution to this, uh, to this challenge. <laughs> but we'll dive more into this uh, after we have heard also the, uh, the other panelists. And we'll start right now with uh, Yogesh uh, that will present the, uh, the, the perspective from our ground handling providers. Yogesh, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, just checking, John, you can see my presentation. Yeah, we're still, yeah, we can see the presentation, not in full screen, but in the kind of normal mode. Shall I go full screen and try it? Let's, let's try it and hope for the best. Does that work? Perfect. Excellent. Thanks. Excellent. Well, okay, great. Great. Well, first of all, thank you. Thank you very much for the ESA team for arranging safety week. Um, a great initiative coinciding with World um, Wellbeing Week. Uh, well, that was great timing, John. Um, so over the next 10 minutes, uh, I'll outline how Men's Aviation have set up our integrated SMS. I'll give you a perspective of what, uh, from a grand handler's point of view, um, I'll focus on the why, the how, and the what, and I'll point out where areas what worked and what didn't work. Uh, I'll talk about how we're trying to foster a safety culture, uh, which is a key enabler, us, uh, enabler for us. And then I'll talk about our future challenges um, and uh, what we, what, what perhaps what we should be doing for it. So and I look forward to any questions that you might have at, uh, at the end of all our presentations. So let me, let me talk about the why. So for us, it's all about the people. Um, you know, ground service providers work around the clock, against the clock, in all weathers. We work in busy environments to support our passengers throughout every step of their airport journey. Today, we tend to be the largest employers at most airports. An integrated SMS approach enables us to use data intelligence to better serve the people and support initiatives where it matters the most. So um, it, we, we believe in our, we have a set of core principles within Menzies. Um, uh, John knows this really well. Uh, it's Morse, it's Menzies operating to procedures designed to keep you safe. It's acting responsibly by, if you see something, say something. It's taking care of your safety, the safety of your colleagues and the safety of, of everybody else. Um, and it's working effectively as one team to achieve our goal. Um, we weaved this into the fabric of our organization, whether you're from onboarding. Um, I was at a hiring event yesterday and we were talking about what this Morse code means to us. For those of you who, who uh, Remember the maritime um, um, some years ago, uh, the Morse code. So it's dot, dot, dash, dot, dot. It's the international language that everybody understands. So that's, that's the idea about Morse. And, and it helps us to promote um, hazard reporting. It helps us to give people a, uh, a code that they work to, to help them to make better choices. It helps us to continuously monitor the heartbeat of the organization and then testing how effective that is. And it helps us to keep driving that message. Um, an integrated SMS is like uh, painting the fourth bridge in, in Scotland. It never ends. You start one end, and by the end, by the time you get to the, uh, to the end of the bridge, you have to start again. So it's continuous. 
So our approach, our approach is very business like, um, but when you're creating a framework, uh, you have to keep in mind, um, you know, what are the motives? What motivates people to buy into your programs? You have to think about what means do you give them? You know, how do you communicate that to them? Um, and then you have to create opportunities for them to be able to, in, to, have, to deliver it. So um, what are the barriers to success? You can see the tips on the screen, but the barriers in my mind is don't overcomplicate, keep it simple. Uh, don't lose sight of your, what you're trying to achieve. Um, next one for me is if you can't measure it, um, and if you can't measure the desired effect, then how are you going to drive improvement? Um, for me, when I speak to people, it's about explaining the why. What's in it for them? Why should they do this? Um, so you've got to get you've got to get people to buy into your program. You've got to get people to uh, to to live it. Um, and our arch enemy is duplication. Um, be on this mission to try and eradicate duplication within our organization. Um, and it could start from all the way from onboarding, um, induction training, training, mentoring, supervision, from all our compliance programs up to um, our management review. So it's really looking at from, from a start, from a cradle to grave um, a view of your business. So the way the way we do this is we, we have a very simple approach. We we have uh, minimum standards that we would expect no matter where you are, whether you're in Manchester or Melbourne, um, we would expect uh, these, we call them the eight pillars. There are eight core pillars. Each pillar is owned by a custodian. So it's, so for example, risk is owned by me, corporate governance is owned by a corporate affairs director, people is owned by our EVP for people. And we are responsible to design those processes, those policies, make sure they're measurable, make sure um, we are able to articulate, communicate to people about those, and it's well understood. Um, and then this is, this is how we would, uh, we will use the eight pillar programs in all our integrations, all our onboarding, all our communications, and it helps our managers, our supervisors to know what's expected of them so that they can then make sure they deliver a safe, secure quality service. We, we, we embed best in industry practice. Um, there's no point reinventing the wheel. Um, they are tools and tools out there to help you. But the art of this is how you communicate. You know, is it message sent and is it message received? And you do this through your training programs, through your communications, through your constant nudges, uh, through your safety alerts, and you will test that understanding of people. Independently, we also test this through our daily uh, smart app. So our smart app is our quality control tool. It allows us to see um, what are those emerging trends that happen um, day in, day out. Um, and then proactively look to start addressing them. Um, and then the last bit of any integrated SMS, for us, the most fundamental aspect of it is the management review. And this happens from top, from the very top, all the way down to the grassroots level. So if I start at grassroots, every single uh, station of ours has a health and safety forum. We invite that, um, that participation from all our employee groups. It's code, uh, it's, so it's chaired by them, it's code managed by our managers and actively together they work together to try and resolve those emerging trends at their local level. At a regional level, we have our SQRBs, uh, which are safety quality review boards. And they look, this, they look at it from a regional perspective because there are global regional trends. Um, and then at head office level, we also do this with the very senior management team and then into, into our board. So it does go from bottom up 
to top down um, so that we're all we're all focused on on preventing and reducing accidents. So we looked at we looked at things that didn't quite work. We have this strategy. We call it the three D's: diagnose what doesn't work, design a solution, and then deliver it. Um, and there's a number of solutions here. You can see, um, for example, the smart app. We re-engineered this because we saw a huge amount of new people coming into the business. So we looked at how we can become less compliant, uh, less compliance, but more focus on coaching. And it's about how we coach people. Um, and uh, we 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 introduced something else into our app. We call it the excellence button. And we try to reinforce that positive behavior. So uh, on our high visits, you'll see the Morse code. Our managers are encouraged to, as they walk their patch, if they see people, you know, um, acting responsibly or design, following those principles you design to keep you safe, um, people, um, you know, they will congratulate them. They will give them a smart excellence. Um, the next one for us, uh, if I pick out another one, is frictionless reporting. Uh, frictionless reporting, uh, cast your memory back. When somebody wants to report an incident, they have to, they report to the supervisor who's busy running around trying to um, capture this, put it on a piece of paper. By the end of the shift, they go back to the office and then log it into the system. Sometimes it gets lost. Um, so we've redesigned this. We have uh, a, a, a app, which is Swift reporting. It doesn't require any download. You simply, uh, hover your internet enabled device with your mobile phone over a QR code um, and uh, zap it. Ask you three questions. What happened? Where it happened? How did it happen? Um, you can leave your name. You don't need to have to leave your name. And if you want feedback, you can tick a box to say you want feedback. Then you have to leave your email address so that we can we can give you feedback. That was the single biggest um, uh, achieve, uh, uh, positive results for us. Because what we found was we had a 171% increase in hazard reporting. Uh, that led to a, um, we just finished our review for uh, uh, our, our safety security action group review, but a 50% reduction in near misses um, and a 10% improvement month for month. Um, so that's, for us, that's been, that's been a great initiative. We call it spot the hazard, stop the near miss, prevent the incident. Um, and so it's, it's allowing that uh, culture for people to very easily report something without fear or favor. We also looked at re-engineering some of our surveillance. Um, we, know our, we know our operations are incredibly busy and we live in this date, data rich um, uh, environment. So we're leveraging use of this. Um, if you have Office 365, most of you would have them power automate. Uh, power automate is a it's a bot. Uh, they call it robotic process automation. And what it allows you to do then it, it, you can program your bot. It's quite easy. You don't need to be um, a, 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 a computer genius. Um, even people like me uh, who are an IT lug night can can actually program your bot. Um, and it allows us to grab these leading and lagging indicators and uh, churn this data. When we when we started um, looking at our internal resources, just my team was spending 21 days in churning data. It's crazy. Um, so we looked at how we can automate this so it allows us to help us see what's coming and more importantly, focus on what matters the most. Um, the most key thing with any SMS is about what the desired effect, what is it you're trying to achieve? And we want people to follow procedures, not because they have to, because they want to. So we're on this mission. We want every everybody to think, to think, and they, they know what Morse means. Uh, we want people to feel what, uh, so that they can act in a Morse way. And we want people to do uh, so they, they um, stay safe, work responsibly, and effectively. So what's what's coming around the corner? Um, we know for a, a true integrated SMS, 
you have to work with everybody. Um, working in silos doesn't work. So you, you have to work with your airport authority, you have to work with your customers, you have to work with other entities in order to be able to understand what's what's emerging, what's happening. So it's monitoring the behaviors. Um, and, and as an industry, as a ground service provider industry, we've actually created a, um, a, uh, a, a, a program called SID, it's Safety Incident Database. It allows say, uh, ground service providers to be able to report their incidents without any, it's completely de-identified data. Um, it's Chatham House rules. Uh, there are no free text fields. All of them are dropped down. And what it allows ground service providers is valuable data on the latest industry trends. They can benchmark their performance against um, the industry. Um, and it allows GSPs to be a bit more proactive in reviewing their mitigation strategies. Even if they don't have those industry trends, they're allowed to then review back and see, see what's happening in, in their own organization to make sure those controls are effective. Um, if I take uh, one of these threats, the biggest one for us, um, which we see coming now, um, and we, we talk about talent recruitment retention. Yes, that's a, an existing risk that we're all living and breathing today. But what's coming around the corner that is going to really hurt? Um, and what we do see is cyber threats on the increase. Um, and just to give you a, a bit of a view, uh, when I look, when I work with our IT folks, they tell me uh, 4.9 million. Um, um, malicious emails come through their email gateway. It's crazy. That's just in a week. Um, we filter, we have systems that filter out 73% of them. Um, and then we have programs that then manage the rest. Uh, thankfully, we don't have that many um, that actually materialize uh, or make it through. But it's about education. Um, and what we realize is about we need to keep educating people. Because that education not only helps them at work, it also helps, helps them at home. Um, and the, the, what, for us, what we do see, if we, we did this um, test where we actually did a simulated uh, phishing email campaign, and what we found was 16% of our users actually clicked on the email. 2% actually filled in their credentials. So people are still fooled by 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 uh, by these phishing events and this um could then materialize into um uh, challenges in, of loss of data um and maybe even loss of operations so i mean it's a uh, it's a very it's a very brief outline of what we are trying to do um and what how we how we manage our uh sms uh, but the key message for us is keep it simple and it's all about the people. Thank you, John. Thank you very much, Agish, indeed. Uh, thank you for, for reminding us that aviation remains and will remain a people's industry. We, we work with tremendous technology, but it's a people industry and they should be at the heart of, of these systems. Also for, for uh, demystifying SMS, there's a tendency of keeping it complex and, and becoming a bit theoretical, intellectual. Uh, it's not, it's simple, it's there to help. And that the SMS, it's a matter that has to permeate throughout the organization. It doesn't sit in a lab on the corner of the organization of the, or of the organigram. It's something you, you breathe and leave. And of course, very good point. I think we, we all have it at, at the top of our heart. You cannot manage what you cannot measure. So focus on, on getting the right measurement. This will help improving uh, in the future. Thanks a lot, Yogesh. We'll, we'll dive more into these elements as uh, we will have the debate in the panel, but not before hearing out uh, uh, Declan from, from Dublin presenting uh, his perspective on integrating management system. Over to you, Declan. Thank you, Edward. Just gonna check, can you see the screen okay? Not yet. Not yet. Oh, it's coming now. There we go. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Listen, thanks very much for your time and thanks for every morning, everyone, for um uh from, from Dublin. 
Uh, just my name is Declan Collins, and I had a safety at Dublin Airport, and I've been the role for I've been the company for fourteen years, and I head up the safety office and the safety manager as well. So it's very uh, I'm very excited to be here this morning and talk through some of the initiatives that we're working at at Dublin Airport um, over the over the last while. In terms of integrated SMS, I suppose like the common themes we would have heard earlier from Yasmin Yogesh and from Edward from John setting the scene, we we see very much. Uh, the airport and the aviation network is in a very much integrated system. Um, so, like the integrated SMS really speaks to that. So, what's been sort of a, you see there at the bottom image of the screen is, is Croke Park. It's the national sport is GAA, and we might be able to build the pitch as an aerodrome operator, but we need a, a number of actors involved in that environment to make the 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 the, the, the football game work. Likewise, in an aviation setting. It's the exact same approach. Cogs in a wheel is another different analogy we can use. And the other image we have in the, in the slate is we are uh, in the late advanced stage of, of commissioning uh, um, a new northern runway. Uh, so two eight right, one zero left. And that then will be coming online in August of this year, which in and of itself is, a, is an example of an integrated approach as to how we bring this infrastructure from concept to delivery on site to operation, which involves all of the players that, that will have a have an impact from, from, for ourselves at Dublin Airport. I like that we've got the airdrome operator, which ourselves, but then equally we need the airlines with the ground handlers and we need the NSP to make the whole system work. So we can't just no no one person's an island and we can't make make a, make unilateral decisions which have a, a knock on impact or a negative impact on the operation or the safety of either the airlines, the ground handlers, or how NSP can navigate and control the space in, in, in that area. Moving on, I suppose, from a concept level or from a principle perspective, um, like when you look at incidents and occurrences that happen, because we have occurrences happening all the time, do we want to be reactive about it? I we react to all these occurrences, or do we want to move into the headspace of being proactive? And in order for us to be proactive, we have to work with our stakeholders. We have to work with the learnings, a collaborative learning from any incident, because we may have one um, a view of an event, be it a deviation from clearance or a potential Roman incursion, whereas the, when you look at the speak to the pilots and what's going on in the flight deck or speak to the uh, tower controllers and what's going on in the tower or, or even if there's a push package what what's going on with the ground handlers it gives another context another another example of what how our system needs to look at and needs to change needs to adapt to make sure that any new infrastructure or any existing infrastructure that needs to be tweaked can be tweaked and can be can 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 then inform our capital investment program to make sure that we're not repeating some of the issues we would, we would have we would have in the past because we're constantly moving on and, and aviation is the, can be at the vanguard and the cutting edge of of, of of technologies and we need to make sure that we're at that and, and we're learning them across the board on a on a on an equal measure. As as a sort of a worked example as to how this looks, so back in towards the middle end of 2018, we would have had a a, 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 a spike in reports of deviations from ATC clearance based on a, a new reporting format that was brought in place within within the NSP. And so everything that was any deviation, any misstandards that was being reported in that space. Now that would have obviously warranted us to investigate as any occurrence, what's going on in the ground, what's going on in the in the flight deck, and then what's going on within the tower. So there's actually three actors at play at this. So it's a very good example in terms of how we should be looking at shared learnings and how we could be looking at a stakeholder consultation and stakeholder engagement in terms of these events. So when we get any deviation coming in, we obviously get a report from that deviation from from the from the tower. That then feeds into our safety occurrence reporting system, which then triggers an investigation and follow up. We do a site inspection to make sure there's no issues regarding markings and no issues regarding signage. But then, equally from a micro, from a from a from a strategic level, we put this into our LRST, and the LRST is a standard agenda item in terms of what initiatives we can take going forward. So, some of the examples we're looking at in terms of working together to see what learnings you can put in place. So. We now have a we have a crosswind runway 1634. We've run with guard lights 24 7 that crosswind runway because to make sure we've got a, a heightened awareness of that runway area because we've got a lot of pilots who may fly in once, may not fly into the airport for another six months' time. We've got uh, an awareness campaign. We've got a project in place looking at ILCMS, which is follow the green technology, which will which will assist uh, in, in in relation to that. And in Dublin, we've got um, parallel taxiways, some of code E clearance, some of code C clearance. So we've, we've, we've um, embarked upon a, a project which literally starts on site this week, 
um, to effectively widen the taxiways to have compar- uh, parallel codes north, south, east, west, to allow then, uh, while there may still be an issue, but allow increased pilot situational awareness. And that was a direct uh, result of engage with the pilots, engage with the tower controllers, because we've certain pockets of the area which would have, which would be legacy areas, uh, Link 4 in particular is a 45,000 square meter area with eight entry and exit points to it. And because it's such a vast array of concrete, there's no location for raised signage. So by creating these two parallel um, codes, we're able to put in the islands, uh, which will allow us then to put in some raised signage and again, improve situational awareness across the pilot. So this has been a uh, run through our local runway safety team. And uh, as I said, it's a standard agenda to make sure that any learnings we have or any instance we have or any feedback we get from the flight decks uh, from all carriers is fed back into these projects to make sure that we're that we're that we're that we're that we're, um, that we're, t- that we're addressing the, the the core issue that 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 will that will ultimately make the situation safer and more efficient. In turn, just touching a few bits of regarding safety culture because we've we've embarked another another initiative at Dublin Airport, which I'd like to talk to talk to you through this morning. Um, in relation to safety culture, like we would have started back in 2018, 2019, uh, pre-COVID to look at how we can embark upon improving the safety culture across the airport. We were aware of an initiative that was being run by Eurocontrol and London School Economics, which is called the Safety Stack, uh, which was being put in place in Luton and was coming online in Bristol. But as part of that, we had an internal sort of workshop in terms of how, what do we need to do? What are the challenges we see? So one of the things was the multiple stakeholders and the multiple employee groups, staffing levels, how we can deal with the peaks and troughs of, of an aviation sector uh, while maintaining competency across the board. It is a highly diverse and challenging environment. We obviously have to make, maintain compliance with all regulations. We have to reach our safety targets and we have to support capital investment because Unless we can get capital investment program on site and delivering, we won't be able to realise the fruits of the benefits that that system actually brings with it. New infrastructure coming online. We spoke about the the North Roma one zero to uh, left to right coming online, which is which is a first for Dublin, it's a first for Ireland. The parallel Roma operations, which again is a is a difference in terms of not only the infrastructure we're building on site, but equally then how we operate around that. So that obviously means. We need to look at not only our own operation, but equally the airlines operation and the ANSP operation. And delivering a whole journey for passengers. Um, and we've seen obviously in recent news events and recent uh, IR that that's, that's a core focus for us because um, there's no point in us sitting back and giving ourselves a pat in the back if passengers can't get to our side and passengers can't get to make the flights because we are a people business and we are a service industry. And obviously then over the last while with the return of our own renovations, how the COVID and how the impact of COVID is hitting us and even now today we, we we still have COVID in in the society which is a plan and impact in terms of staff and levels and stuff that we might talk might, might talk on, touch on in the q a but suppose the one thing for us is safety culture is key for all stakeholders as a safety office we open the door and, and to asper's point earlier on um there's there's commercial discussions taking place with stakeholders there's legal discussions taking place with stakeholders but as a safety office we open the door and we don't have any of that baggage uh for, forgive the term uh, we're able to uh, engage with the stakeholders on a safety to safety level and we get a lot of traction in that space and, and it's a very it's a very positive space in that area there are there are challenges there's, there's stresses we're humans but um culture is, is and safety culture is a key focus for us and it's a focus now for us at board level which is great to see in terms of the, the safety stack program per se so it's fundamentally about safety culture uh, so following two very safety instances in the, in Europe, Eurocontrol took um, both instances from like safety cultures. Eurocontrol took an initiative to develop a programme. And the first sort of cohort within that programme was the NSP. And it's now been rolled out to, to Eurodrums in the, in the recent past. And I suppose like, in, in, at, at its core, and as we all know on the call, there are many organisations who have to work together to enable a smooth and safe operation. So airlines, air traffic control, ground handlers, fuelers, uh, the met, met for uh, the weather forecasters. Uh, there's a number of different component parts. We, we're all interconnected. If one party is a problem, like we would have seen in recent media reports, everyone has a problem because we're, we're, we're causing delays, and then delays will have a knock-on impact in terms of congestion on the airfield, which will have a knock-on impact in terms of turnarounds, which will have a knock-on impact in terms of um, uh, other satellite airports, which which will have an impact in that space. And I suppose if we, we need to work closely together. And the whole premise of the stack is that from the ground up, 
It's in a single airport location. It's a multi-stakeholder and it kicks off with a survey. So there's sort of a graphical representation of what the stack button holds and how that can, uh, how that can, uh, can, can develop in that program. And again, it's, it's, champ it's an independent survey, it's an independent program, um, which is developed initially by Eurocontrol London School Economics. The idea then is to develop a stack with it, the stakeholders within, the, within an airport to allow then us to come together, look at the issues we have, look at the challenge we have, uh, at Dublin and develop bespoke and collaborative solutions that will meet them challenges. I think that's that's something that, that we're supportive of at board level and we're supportive then to, to work with stakeholders in terms of how best we can make the things better for tomorrow as opposed to worrying about yesterday, which which uh, which which is just a key focus for us in, in, in trying to achieve that proactive approach. Just as an example of some of the initiatives that would have been um, developed, so London Luton have had stack in place for a number of years yet. And, and what they would have done is uh, they'd several grab, ground handling organisations with different turnaround procedures, and that could leave a variation. We're in the exact same space in terms of variation regarding uh, inconsistencies of approach. And, and Yogi sort of spoke earlier on regarding keeping it simple and, and making it follow. And, and some of the airlines we would work with uh, uh, that, 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 that operate in Dublin have very simple one page long SOPs, one, one, one standardised procedures across the board. And it's a model that I think will, 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 will bear a lot of fruit should we bring it out but what what the Luton did in conjunction with the stakeholders is develop a set sort of simple procedures standardized procedures for various tasks around the operation which was built into the ground operations manual and in that first year it showed a hundred percent decrease in ground handling damage incidents against a five percent increase in traffic and a seven percent increase in on time performance so it brings massive safety benefits, but equally it, it, it ticks boxes in terms of efficiency and on-time performance, which is which is a win-win for all parties. Bristol then obviously kicked off in 2019, uh, and as part of their program, they've looked at the well-being of staff. I think that's probably key in the recent past regarding COVID, uh, regarding a lot of turnover staff, staff being on furlough, uh, on isolated, um, and at various challenges in that space. And to look at there's target and four conversations a day for all operational staff, both positive and negative. So it's not a case that whenever ops one drive up, oh, we're in trouble. Ops one drive up, they could be saying that you've you've done a well, you've done a good, a, a good, a, a good thing there. You've you, you've noticed a bit of fraud. You've put, you've you've addressed it, or you've addressed an issue. You've solved the problem, which is something we want to do, as a wider airport. And I suppose they've looked at ramp improvement groups, which is separate to what the, the, the various forums that we would have in terms of EAS and our regulatory requirements, but a ramp improvement group then to look at the ramp across the board and see what initiatives we can do with they can deal with uh, to address the challenges that, that stakeholders have seen. Where we are in our journey in the airport is we launched the survey back in early April. We closed it after three weeks uh, in the end of April. So that number, the number crunching is being done now by the London School of Economics. Um, and we're expecting reports back in in uh, in late August, early September. So we're putting in place workshops with all parties. And these workshops are with stakeholders only; they're not with the airport. And then the view then, whenever everyone has their workshops and get the feedback in terms of the survey results, we'll convene a stack meeting, uh, which will be in September, October time, uh, to effectively kick off the stack proper, um, to sort of see right, okay, what's the challenge? What's the top three or four items we we, we need to look at? And then as a group come up with this potential solutions in that space and how we can move forward collaboratively uh, to address these challenges because uh, it might uh, you know we might do something that will solve a problem for me but that may necessarily increase the challenge for a ground handler or might increase the challenge for an airline or might increase the challenge for the ansp i mean there's no point in us doing that that's a that, that zero-sum game in that space we want to make sure that we're we're addressing these challenges uh, collectively in terms of some of the future challenges, I suppose I want to, I'd like to sort of touch on, um, like we've got obviously staffing challenges, uh, and and you know, you asked what I spoke to to that theme earlier on. Um, we're moving to a, a sort of a change in demographic, a change in approach to aviation, the sustainability and environmental process that we need to get ahead of as as a sector. We've got drones and unmanned flight operations in a space. Like, will the airport become part of that solution in that space, or? Uh, we currently have a drone detection system being 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 uh, being launched at, at Dublin uh, to 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 deal with the negative impacts of drones. But then, can drones be a positive? Congestion is a challenge uh, in in the airport, and how that model works uh, going forward uh, into the space. And then, with the VR technology and all the challenges we we have in that space, is, is there is there going to be a change in terms of the approach of how passengers interact with the airport? 
how passengers interact with with the airlines, how passengers interact with with the with, with the entirety of the aviation sector. So, is there a couple of challenges that we just need to be cognizant of? Because uh, my my own belief is that we need to work together, uh, both at national, European level, international level, um, in terms of dealing with these challenges head on. Because um, as we would have seen, even the recent media reports, uh, a, a challenge that's maybe happened in Dublin is replicated in other air airports across Europe. And is there a better way of us approaching these things, um, both from a a regulatory perspective, from a strategic perspective, uh, and and from from an operator perspective, uh, that we need to look at. And I suppose some of some of the um, some of the challenges, just to sort of to, to close up on, uh, like how do airports maintain that service from a resource perspective? How do we look at that change in dem uh, dem demographic, e-commerce? You know the balance between low cost, uh, low fares. Um, you know there's a there's a high focus in terms of safety. How do we make sure that that retains a high focus at all times when there's rising uh, um, uh, fuel costs and resource challenges? It will ultimately increase pressure, but we have up fundamentally, we owe it to ourselves, we owe it to the entire aviation sector to maintain that focus of, uh, of safety and, sec and security at the fundamental core of everything we do. And like, I suppose for me, and, and I, suppose I spoke about the unmanned flight and how we can airports be a part of that in terms of, you know, where we might move away from a ground taxi perspective to a, a verti port, uh, which is something that's been looked at and exciting in the initiative that's been developed across Europe, which is good to see. And I suppose like, in terms of change approach, like, is there a new approach in terms of engaging, working together, sharing data information across the IAS states? And I agree fully with Yasper in terms of, you know, we, we have Chinese walls ourselves in terms of making sure that the, 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 the just culture and the data can be shared, but is there more we can do in that space? Is the standard is that across the board. Standardization of processes, equipment and training. Is there stuff we can do in that area from a from a from a from a turnaround perspective, so that you know it's it's, it's standardised. So like we could, we could look at uh, labour from from different jurisdictions or different different countries, different competent authorities coming in to to help out at times of stress, and um, I suppose looking at technology and adapting quicker, uh, and how we can sort of we can utilise that, acknowledge them with the, the commercial constraints that are imposed upon us, but you know is there things we can do in the margins that will that will see this as, as an entire aviation sector. And I'd just like to conclude in one final pitch. Now, this is, is ideally one of the most picturesque GAA pitch in Ireland. It's a, it's a, it's a lovely county called Wicklow, uh, just to the south, uh, the south uh, of, of Dublin. And um, it, it comes back full theme in terms of like, we as an aerodrome operator can provide the pitch um, and, and, and great be compliant. But we need the players, we need the airlines, we need the ground handlers, we need everyone. Uh, on that pitch to be uh, fully integrated, fully involved, fully engaged uh, in that in that experience to make a success uh, of, of 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 the of the sector. And I firmly believe, and I, I don't just say that, but like whenever um, the aviation sector as a whole pulls together, there's very few challenges that we can't meet. There's very few challenges that we can't face head on, and there's very few challenges that we can't adapt and, and, and exceed in. Um, and I suppose I'd just like to conclude on that, on that, on that image, as I said, we, we are a pitch and uh, we want to work together to make the, the, the very best of it and, uh, and, and be a success for the aviation future going forward. Thank you very much for your time. Well, then, uh, Declan, thank you very much. It was, was an excellent presentation. Uh, thank you very much for the optimism. Um, I, I fully agree. Yes, we can take any challenge. Uh, but we need to be prepared for that. Thanks uh, a lot um, for, for stressing again the importance of, of safety culture uh, as, a, as indeed the key enabler of cooperative working in terms of, um, so for example, the, the stack initiatives. I very much subscribe to your point that it's everybody's problem. Uh, not anyone is, is in its own safe bubble, um, isolated from the rest of the ecosystems that integrate so much in the world of aviation. So uh, we need, we all have to find a solution, even if it's not within, let's say, uh, an immediate uh, need coming from uh, one part of that, uh, of that supply chain. <clears throat> And also very interesting and, and I think an, a topic that we'll have to dive more during our discussion is about uh, that the work of, of uh, safety practitioners is never done. We see evolving risks. We need to grow and, and up our game as, as we move along, as we embrace new technology, new operating concepts. Uh, there's also 
other ways of us interacting with other sectors of uh, of the society you mentioned drones uh, environmental uh, social and, and educational so all will have an impact and we need to, to move ahead and, and be ready for that thanks to to the very interesting presentations now is the moment to um, uh, to engage them uh, more directly uh, perhaps uh, Declan uh, if you can uh, unshare your your screen I am um, trying my best to. How do I do that now? And I will I will start it with a question for uh, for all of you. Um, you all have been presenting uh, your approach to integrated uh, management systems, um, and, and show what it takes for those to be properly integrated. Uh, and you are believers that this is the way forward. But the question, and ultimately everything goes down to uh, yeah, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. Give us good concrete examples when it really made a difference. We, we, we're discussing during the, uh, the presentation of your Gish about this need to, to demystify and keeping it simple. And I will start with Jasper to, to, to ask him and please the other colleagues join as well. Give us concrete example when you see that indeed having an integrated approach of managing safety on an aerodrome has really made a difference. Yeah, thanks for this question. Um, uh, one example that uh, immediately uh, comes into my mind is uh, the risk of uh, taking off from a taxiway. Uh, at Schiphol, we had a taxiway takeoff in 2010. And in 2019, we had a potential uh, attempted take off from the taxiway. Um, and this is the kind of incident which, um, if, you, if you look at it from your own perspective, um, well, A to C will say, well, we, we gave a, a takeoff clearance, huh? so the, the pilot should not take off from the taxiway. Uh, the aerodrome might say, well, all our infrastructure is EASA compliant, so uh, th that's not a problem. And the airline would say, well, there's no pilot who uh, goes to work with the with the the, 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 the thing in mind to, 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 to take off from a, a taxiway. So it must be an honest mistake. Uh, but if you stay at that level in the discussion, uh, well, you, you don't uh, easily solve it. So uh, we did a joint incident investigation and then we also did a, a risk analysis uh, on the, the, the probability and severity of this, uh, this type of risk. And it, it uh, emerged to be a, a really high risk at Schiphol at that time. So we discussed this uh, with the nominated persons and they, well, obviously we couldn't accept the risk, but also they needed immediate uh, mitigations. Um, and we put those in place. So we, we did the rerouting of the, the taxi flows, which was a solution of A to C. Uh, we briefed all the pilots with, uh, with making it a hotspot. And we also uh, adjusted the, 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 the lighting uh, on the, the critical locations from the aerodrome. So we had a, also a truly joint package of solutions. And we were able to prove that the residual risk was then in the acceptable region. So this, in my view, is, is typically an example of an, an, uh, a, a real risk because we had incidents, uh, which is also a, a high risk. And by doing it together, we, uh, we quickly uh, reduced it uh, and, and made it safe again. Thank, thanks a lot, uh, Jasper, for, for sharing this. I think it's, it's very tangible indeed. Of, of having a solution that involves all the parties that otherwise would have felt that there's nothing to to be done on this side. Anything else from from the other colleagues that they can think of of a clear example where it really made a big difference? Um, uh, maybe Edward, I, I could talk about um, breakaway dollies, or um, if you think about uh, how we move baggage containers or cargo pallets, they towed on a train of dollies. And we, uh, we I chair um, the safety forum for the airport, for the ASA, which is the Airport Services Association. We recently 
in our quarterly catch ups. We're talking about a trend that came um, that came that we saw in the data, where breakaway dollies was was um, was on the rise, and um, it, we know equipment was mothballed for some time. We knew we have lots of new people that are in operations, um, and um, so what what we did was we looked at it holistically. We identified actually there's no standard. What happened was uh, over time the metal fatigues, particularly with the eyelet where the toe where, where the toe arm is, um, and uh, um, and looked at well how how do people spot these signs? So we create some awareness programs. What we also realised from talking to people, uh, we found actually there's no place really to lock the pin. There's no industry standard. Um, some, you know, some of our membership share initiatives that they had put in place because they saw their risk, um, which led to us contacting um, uh, st industry stakeholders to write SOPs and design a, a fix, a standard for all new um, towing hitches, um, so they're lockable. They don't, they don't jump out um, when, you, when you're towing these trains of dollies. Um, on, on a tarmac that may not be as flat uh, as, as as some of you and I would experience on a public road. Um, so I think I think uh, uh, if I just want, wanted to make a point, um, you know what Jasper said, what Declan said, it is about collaborating and it's about sharing that knowledge so that we all benefit. Um, and it was it, it was clear to me just listening to my colleagues speaking. That is a constant theme uh, throughout our, our presentation. So, uh, uh, just from a grand handler's perspective, uh, uh, that's one of the uh, good takeaways that we found in order to try and drive down those incidents. Because could those breakaway dollies could run into a live taxiway, they could damage, hurt somebody, or they can they can uh, damage an aircraft. So it's it's important that we all we we all listen and and proactively try to contribute to help. Thank, thank you very much, Agish. Um, then um, another question, and I will start with uh, first with, with Declan, but I think the others are, are very much uh, encouraged to, to chip into this discussion. We see in this integra integrated management system that we have stakeholders that might have different objectives, different interests. Sometimes they may even be competing with each other that will be part of, of those um, initiatives. And, and how can you really bring them together and how you can ensure that in the end, the ownership in terms of the action is actually owned and, and leads to successful mitigation so it does not only become a, a forum for discussion, but it's also a forum of action. So Declan, how do you see this, this challenge of, of bringing everybody in the same room and, and getting something constructive out of it? Well, I think, I think that's, uh, that's, that's uh, you, you answered the point in a way, like getting people around the room, that's why the challenges of COVID would have created some challenges for us in terms of that virtual space, the two dimensions. So everyone in the, in the same space, in the same room. I think we have to explain where um, the challenges are, where we're coming from in that space. Um, like what we t find to have with the challenge of the aviation sector from an aerodrome perspective, we're, we're not asking for something that it might be difficult, it might be you know ch challenging for some of the operational norms, but it's, we're not going to stop something or stop a, a critical asset from, from 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 opening or stop something from from challenging that space. Uh, at least not initially. Uh, you know, we, we want to make sure we work with people in terms of that shared learning, that shared communications. Like we, we tend to take the lead a lot in terms of the actions and, and deliverables because you know what's what's in our control is in our control, and what's in our influence is in our influence. And if we want to see actions, want to see tacit actions, we will say we need to look at the um, we we need to take the lead in terms of what we can do. Um, we will we tend to now. Um, when we're talking about any operational issues, uh, pitch them as subgroups of the LRST, which gives them a governance uh, element of it to allow us then from a, from a report back to the LRST and a report back to the executive so that there's 
clear transparency in terms of what actions are being what's being discussed, what actions have been agreed, both within our executive and our es uh, escalation process at the board level. So then whenever conversations are happening with other party executives and other party board level, um, that them conversations can happen in that space to make sure that we've got collective understanding, collective accountability in terms of once we agree something within a room that that's being delivered upon. Um, and I suppose I'll go back with like, what we'll be asking for, what we'll be looking for would not be unreasonable. Uh, it wouldn't be something we'd be saying we need to if, if totally, totally stop or fully, totally uh, uh, impact a, a significant impact or operation. But we would look to working with the stakeholders to see where we can get the benefit of that shared issue and that shared challenge. Uh, which would be the first part of that round the table discussion to identify here's the challenge we're having to address, how best can we address it? And I suppose one final thing is it, it wouldn't be the case that uh, uh, it's only Declan Collins that can come up with a solution for Dublin Airport. Uh, all stakeholders, all people in that room would have a voice and that voice would be heard. Um, and that's the one guarantee we would give people. So if somebody comes up with a solution, which is the best solution that we have, well, then that's the solution we'll run with and we'll put the full weight of the organisation behind that solution to get to its needs. I think that's where we can get buy-in at, at, at multi-stakeholder level. Thanks a lot, uh, Declan. I like the, the term collective accountability and indeed it's it's everyone's journey, it's everyone's um, call to, to contribute and, and to be part of that solution. There was a question also coming in the chat, uh, and I would like to, to ask you uh, all, in terms of uh, your relationship with the regulators, what do you see the role of the regulators in the, con in the context of this discussion? Uh, can they contribute? Should they better stay out and let you do and take care of everything? Um, you, you are, uh, let's say, safety is being done in the front line. The regulators are there to help, but of course, you are the ones delivering safety on a, on a daily basis. So therefore, the question is, is well timed in terms of the relationship with the regulators. Maybe we'll start with with Jasper, but please, all the others should, should bring their own perspective. Yeah, thank you. Uh for this question uh it's it's a rather good question because uh we are in a um, um well a, elaborate uh, process with our regulator about this uh and this is this is uh, supported by two uh angles of view so to speak one is well we we say that we make uh, that we produce safety and they are the regulator on safety, so they have to form an opinion about it. So they, they, they have a role, and we all see that. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, there's no uh, regulation on uh, integral safety management. And so there's, there's one EASA rule about safety programs, uh, but that, that does not cover uh, all our activities. So we are a bit in uh, in in uh, new waters here, with our uh, competent authority about how we how we how we do this supervision uh, process together. So uh, and and this requires also trust from both sides. Uh, so we we need to trust the regulator that they or the the, the supervisory authority that they um, well the, the, they. Um, are prudent in 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 what they uh, say about us, um, and th and they need to uh, support us in what we are doing. So that's that's um, uh, well um, a bit sensitive sometimes, but we are we are doing fine. So we have the the supervisory authority now uh, auditing us, and we see that that really helps because having this outside view uh always gives you new points for improvement and also uh, because you if you have some successes or you have some results then you can well go into some kind of confidence uh, zone uh, but that is perhaps not always the best best uh, uh, zone to to further improve and to be critical about yourself so we we are developing this uh, together with our uh, supervisory authority uh, and I, I truly see the benefit there. Um, also, and it was also in my slides, they should not be part of our process. And they, they should stay outside, uh, uh, discuss it with us, 
having the critical outside view, they also do audits on us. Uh, and in that way, we, uh, we, we both share uh, or, or contribute uh, each from each other's uh, own role. Thanks a lot, Jasper. Um, Declan, how, how about you? How is the relationship yeah. with the IA? We we had the, the same like a good professional relationship with the regulator. Um, like we pride ourselves in the company of having everyday auditability or everyday uh, accountability. So it means that we've got uh, um, uh, 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 we shouldn't be relying on the competent authority to highlight any areas that we need to look at or we need to focus in on. Our internal compliance program, which is run by a separate corporate department. Uh, would be very robust and, and, a, and a high level of scrutiny in terms of our process and procedures. But I do think the Jasper's point, in, in many respects, is a difference between compliance and safety, uh, and we have to make sure that we that we that we navigate that that uh, that uh, that um, that line um, to make sure we can put in some stands and put in some infrastructure that might be compliant, tick a box, but it may not be safe to operate, and that's where we have to make sure there's a separate discussion in uh, in in process. Uh, to that, um, so that whenever there's conversation, for example, if we're looking to risk assess, review from a stakeholder perspective, like to our earlier point, Edward, the, the earlier question we had as to how we deal with the challenges, um, we would we wouldn't include the competent authority in that discussion uh, initially, uh, or we would ask the competent authority to recuse themselves from the from the from the scoring uh, of any risk assessment process to allow us then to have a more meaningful engagement piece with the stakeholders, for us to develop up what that safety case looks like, for us to be able to demonstrate that it's compliant fully with EASA, for us to be able to demonstrate fully that it's it's compliant with the operational models not only for ourselves but equally the regulatory requirements for both the airlines and ANSP, and then put together a combined safety case both to the regulator from the our, the airdrome perspective, but equally then the regulator from the NSP perspective, and what we're finding, I suppose, is that there may be a, 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 a sort of a slight um, disconnect in terms of timelines. For example, uh, three seven three would require NSP to deliver some timelines, whereas the uh, were 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 held uh, predominantly in the ERAC cycle to make sure we're promptly getting approved before that cycle takes place. So, um, like I said, it's a healthy working relationship. Um, there's, a, there's a line, but we are equally conscious of regulatory capture. Whereby the competent authorities engage in conversations which will uh, compromise their independence, uh, 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 EAS requirements and obligations to uh, as, as a as a certified entity. Um, but yeah, it, it's it's a it, it's a challenge that we're that we're dealing with on a day to day basis. Thank, thanks a lot. Uh, indeed, there's a there's a fine line to walk in terms of building a partnership but maintaining independence. Um, it, it's good to, to, to hear that um, this is recognized, this is back with action, there's transparency uh, in, in the relationship with the regulator. Now, a question coming from uh, from the audience and mainly addressed to you, Yogesh. Uh, it, it's about the uh, upcoming regulations on ground handling. Uh, as you know, IASA is quite busy at work on that. We have actually a very a uh, big uh, webinar coming up in, in two days, presenting our vision in terms of how these new rules will be set up. We have uh, more than a thousand people joining. Uh, but basically the question is now that ground handling will get to be more regulated or regulated in, in its own right, with the other domains like aerodromes and air operations, what, what is your view about how this will affect the interaction between these stakeholders? So, uh, if I take it from a grand handling perspective, um, we've been self-regulating for a number of years. So, what regulation does, it, it formalizes that approach. Um, and I think it gives everybody a level playing field. I think regulators have a very important job. They are the safety net to allow passengers to reach their destination safely and securely. We all have a part to play in helping that regulation to become fit for purpose, remaining, um, you know, uh, making sure that we become the eyes and ears and tell, feed into our regulators to let them know what needs to happen. I think um, from my perspective, it's, it's making sure that regulation doesn't become a tick box exercise. I'll give you a practical example. Um, from as grand handlers, we have 
you did have regulation, then you, um, so you have ACAO, which then feeds down into, um, in, in, into, into the regulators and into, into the company procedures. So we not only have to meet the, uh, the ACAO requirements, we have to then, we work in so many different countries, we have to then adapt to each of the different regulators' point of view. Um, and then we have to adapt to our customers, which might have variances as well. They might have variances as well. So think about our poor individual who uh, comes into work and has to remember all the different types of uh, requirements that they have to do. So it's about helping to try and simplify, standardize, keep it simple, um, and make sure actually uh, we can demonstrate how we meet that regulation. Um, one of the things that we're doing, um, I just share with you, is we're working on this project, um, we call it gamification. In the industry, there's too much read and sign. Everybody uses it to discharge their responsibility that they have informed the person of, their, of that requirement. So think about it, you get one from so many different... What we try to do is remove that requirement, simply uh, actually cut out the noise, make sure it's only simple messages, but gamify it. Um, and so when we have people visiting and say, show me evidence, um, we will be able to demonstrate using our platform that this person's understood that requirement because they've played a game. We can see how many times they've attempted to play the game, see where um, they have uh, understood or not understood, and it helps us using that data to fine tune our messaging. What's in it for the individual? They, they, they. Uh, it's fun. It's engaging. It's um, yeah, they, they rise in the leaderboard. I've had many conversations with people. Says, well, that's not what the regulations state. Uh, you have to, you have to have some form of signature. Why is it? It's electronic. So it's about helping people understand how we take that requirement but actually implement it so that it actually works and it lands, it lands with people. And I think we have a job as ground service providers to keep continuously feeding into, um, uh, feeding, feeding into that, whether it's through having direct conversations, through the forums that we're having, or through industry stakeholders, so that we all work collaboratively and can meet the intent of the standard. Thanks a lot, Yogesh, for the... Yeah, the two aerodrome operators um, and, and running this integrated management system, having ground handling now a regulated domain, will, what is this uh, a challenge, an opportunity, or a, or a hazard? Maybe I, I can give a short comment. I think it's it's very good uh, development uh, because we see that uh, the, the impact on ground handling on uh, on safety uh, is is large. Uh, also, the, the working environment uh, for the people working uh, on the stands uh, to make that safe, uh, it's, it's not always easy. And in the, in the, the, the organization of it, uh, so the, the airlines are contracted, uh, or the airlines contract the ground handler, they also prescribe the procedures. So I'm also interested in, uh, in the, the, the safety stack at LUT and how they, how they uh, made it more uniform. Uh, and the aerodrome operator has the responsibility to, to ensure that that it's all safe. Um, but but to have a, a direct line between the, the competent authority and the ground handler, I think that's a, that's a big improvement. Because then you can, if, if it's it's really clear, you know, you have this 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 minimum uh, level that you need to regulatory level that you need to uh, adhere to and if, if you don't you you can get a finding and then, then the, the, the standard improvement process uh, starts working so in my view it's a good uh, bottom line in the, the quality of work there yeah if i i can come in there i would agree with jasper uh, i think it, it it sets the it sets the pitch, a level playing field i suppose for all parties and like it's uh at the Asper's points, like we have no, while uh, and Yogi's a little, like the ground handler is probably one of the largest staffing groups at the airport. 
but we have no contractual or no uh, uh, relationship in that space. And we have obviously uh, uh, inter um, managers who interact with the uh, ground handlers on a, on a regular basis, on a day-to-day -day basis, and obviously they're part of the key operational meetings, etc. But I suppose having that uh, regulatory example at competent authority level will again give us a, a clear picture and clear understanding in terms of uh, that's the last piece of the, regu the regulated entities. Um, so that would be all parties of the aviation sector at all aerodromes now covered as part of that standardised process, which I think can only be a good thing. Thanks a lot. We are, we are getting uh, closer and closer to our um, end time. Just a one last question coming from uh, from Slido uh, and was uh, touched upon in, in your various presentation. We are increasingly data rich and we are now getting better at using and harnessing this data to get information and intelligence out of it. But it remains very local in that sense. Um, how can we work to give it a more uh, European and international dimension in terms of sharing uh, intelligence and data coming out of these processes that would allow to to benchmark and to compare? Because we do have a lot of emphasis in our rules in in risk assessing and, and making sure that the risk is identified, but uh, the regulation themselves do not set the bar in terms of acceptability of risk. This is left to the organization themselves. And sometimes having the ability to benchmark in terms of risk appetite, uh, I think will, will be indeed a useful development. How do you see this taking it further from integrating the local level to integrating further at European and international level? Edward, maybe I can take this one from a grand handling perspective. So I talked about it in my presentation. Uh, just pre-COVID, we realised that as ground service providers, there is it is it's better to to work together and understand what the threats are. Um, so we 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 all part membership of the ASA, which is the Airport Services Association. We got together as a collective group. Um, and what we try to do is remove some of the previous barriers where um, previous systems required so much information um, and made it so difficult to actually submit your data. Um, and what we try to do is say, what was it we're trying to achieve? How do we how do we submit the data? How do we make sure actually uh, the data is value added and it's and we're able to benchmark? So benchmark is a is a um, it's a benefit from collaborating together because you can see where you are against your peers. Um, but I think it also does it also helps the industry to see what the threats are coming um, coming to us. So you have to make it value added for the people submitting the data. You have to keep it simple and easy for them to do so without any recourse of uh, of people coming back to you and saying. Okay, you're now in trouble. So you have you have to create that trust. You have to create the a mechanism where you can freely contribute, and there's benefits in doing so. Um, so as part of the SID initiative, we're really speaking to Ediana to see how we can better collaborate with ESA, with the Cars Portal, um, and let's maybe look at the comparisons of data sets in both. And see where see where those trends are. We've been talking to our colleagues in IATA to see if we could do something with um, the teams there with IDX. Um, and I think there's more to come. Uh, I think there's more to come. So the more we can collaborate, the better. The more we can share data and learn from it, the better we will all become. So I, I can come in there as well. Uh, uh, Edward, uh, I fully agree with you. Obviously, we'd only have been fine in terms of the um, that 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 sort of embryonic just culture approach and people fear fearful of submitting data in that space. But equally, then uh, we've had some feedback from a uh, from a uh, from 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 other third parties about GDPR and the individual data set and how that's protected whenever that's been shared with, with information. So I think there is there is some maybe some further. Uh, regulatory transparency needed in terms of you know where, where there's something we've obviously gone back in that space, but I am interested with Jasper regarding the non-disclosure agreement um, that's been signed across the board. We've been looking to put something like a memorandum of understanding at the airport ourselves. Now it has been working at an operational level, but I do think 
not only just across each aerodrome, but equally then across each nation state and then across uh, the, the wider IASA aerodrome family, um, we're seeing the same things. We're seeing the same challenges. We have we have the same issues. Um, there could be one solution that works at an airport that everyone needs to look at uh, because it could be a solution that ticks a lot of boxes for a lot of different people. I think, you know, I, I'm all in favour of, of trying to put in the, 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 the strands, the communication channels, the pipelines, to allow us then to 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 to, to utilise in that information, um, in a day that if basis obviously, but then it may it may be something that we can bring collectively and you know again I speak to, to speak to the presentation about standardising you know procedures standardising stand layout etc. Uh, I'm all in favour of that because I think we have to move um, collectively uh, at IASA level as well as as well as national level uh, to deal with the challenges that are coming up. Thanks. Thanks a lot for, for the very wise words. Um, if I were now to, to attempt a, a, a small conclusion of the discussion um, of today, is that the next time we should plan for, for more time since the, the subject is so rich and we can uh, easily go for a, uh, another hour. But I think it's, it's clear consensus in the room uh, about uh, the, the benefits and the the need is not something a nice to have, it's a must do when it comes to collaborating. Uh, especially in the world of aerodromes when so many stakeholders come together, so many technologies come together, uh, it, it's essential to make sure that we are keeping up with the, with the challenges, with the, um, let's say the, the safety uh, challenges that are being thrown at us. But it's not all about safety. Uh, I think we, we are all safety professionals, but it's also about efficiency. Uh, and also as, as from efficiency, it comes uh, yeah, a better footprint in terms of our environmental impact. So there's more to reap out of this collaborative approach that, than only safety. Uh, it's, it's something that came across from all of you. Uh, that people are at the heart of the efforts. Uh, it's not safety doesn't happen by magic. Safety is made by people acting responsibly, knowing what they do. Um, so therefore, keeping it simple, uh, engage people at all level is, is essential, ultimately. Um, that we should be careful uh, to not be driven uh, and then embrace a, a, a facade, a compliance-focused approach. Compliance has its merits, but has its limits. Uh, and compliance and, and safety management should actually coexist and, and complement. So therefore, uh, it, it's important to understand this, um, this coexistence between the two concepts and also the role of the regulators in, in, the, in the two contexts. And uh, I think the challenge that we have is uh, is moving from um, from a time where data was relatively scarce to, to come about to be extremely data rich to the point that the challenge is not to get the data but to make sense out of it uh, and to, to transform in something meaningful actionable I think we all have seen KPIs that are there because you can count something but they don't tell you much uh, and, and they have a perverse effect because the, the moment you start to measure something, that process will change. So measuring the wrong thing can also lead to a quite undesirable effect. Uh, um, something to, to, to keep in mind in the future that uh, with the regulation of ground handling, uh, we have this important uh, stakeholder in this important sector uh, getting the, the recognition it deserves in terms of its importance in, in the economics of aviation and in the safety picture as well being, uh, we discuss about this uh, integrative uh, approaches as being a, a partnership of equals. If we want, uh, we can say that by regulating ground handling, they will be more equal than before uh, in terms of their relationship with, with, the, with the others there on the aerodrome. Uh, and this is good because it allows also for the uh, proper allocation of responsibility. Ultimately, someone has to be responsible for those actions. Uh, with this being said, I want to thank uh, all of you, uh, especially the, um, uh, the, the, the panelists. Uh, we've been very privileged to have really 
believers, you know, passionate people. If it's one thing that really jumped from the screen was people that are really passionate in, in what they're doing, that they are proud of, of showing uh, the, the good uh, work being done in, in Dublin, in Amsterdam, all over the world for Menzies. Um, so from my side, a, a big thank you for, for finding the time uh, and, and being so altruist and, and share what works and sometimes what doesn't work. This is also takes courage to, to be open in, in the and to all of you uh, that were with us during the, uh, the, the workshop, the webinar, uh, thanks a lot for your attention. I hope it was informative. Um, we count on you because we also know you are the ones also delivering safety on, on a daily basis in, in all your walks of life. So from, uh, from my side and here, the team in Cologne, thanks for, for, for the good work and I look forward to, to meet again in, in various forums like this. And in the meantime, Stay safe and uh, keep up the good work. Over and out from Cologne. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, everybody.